Good morning, everyone out there. Uh, this is uh, Joel Mott again with the uh, Pinelands Commission, uh, coming to you with our Thursday morning uh, Pinelands Speaker Series. Uh, today, we're fortunate to have with us uh, Steve Recky. Uh, Steve was, uh, with, works with Rutgers Co-op, and he's going to talk to us about the uh, spotted lanternfly. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions about it lately. We've had a few requests to come up with a, a program on this species in particular. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Steve. <clears throat> okay, Joel, thank you very much. I hope this, the screen there looks good. <clears throat> yep, everything looks uh, very well. Okay, now I just need to be able to advance it. And it's not advancing for me. Okay, there we go. All right, great. All right, yes, uh, Steve Redke, as Joel said, is my name, and I've been with the Extension Service for a number of decades now. And I started first uh, studying and learning about this particular invasive uh, insect from uh, the southeast part of, of Asia called the spotted lanternfly or Lycoma delicatula. And it first was uh, found in Pennsylvania in about, uh, about six years ago in 2014 in the Brooks County area. It was apparently probably always uh, there maybe two years earlier, but it just took them a year or two to be able to discover it. So I just wanted to show this particular photograph here on the, the beginning slide. You notice the, the red area underneath the black eyes on this photograph of the, uh, of the adult spotted lanternfly. Uh, that is not the eye. Uh, many times people will see that bright red area and they think that's the eye, but they're, they're not. They're, each of them is below the actual, almost a jet black eye. It's a compound eye. And so don't be confused. That's actually the red area is a sensory organ. It helps the insect uh, you know, determine the types of trees they wanna feed on. And you know, they certainly wanna gravitate to the hosts that they were able to feed on best, such as the, the uh, tree of heaven, which we'll be talking about in detail. So this is a brief uh, outline of what I plan to talk about. It's a lot to cover. And so I wanna try to keep it under, under an hour. So I'll just keep my fingers crossed and see uh, how fast I can go. But I'm gonna look at the, uh, the spotter and lanternfly life cycle, the egg and the nymph and the adult. Uh, it's uh, immatures or nymphs and not larvae. So that means that it's a simple or partial or incomplete metamorphosis. So they do not have a, a true pupation stage as they go through their molting and life, life stages. Then I'll talk about the spread and the dis uh, distri uh, distribution that has been shown over the last half dozen years. And now it's apparently in six states where it's considered to be uh, invasively uh, established uh, as far as an infestation. And then we'll talk about some of the typical plant hosts and there are a lot of them. Uh, a good number of them and their favorites. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, a little more detail. And as the number four indicates, spending a good amount of time on the tree of heaven, which is uh, Atlantis altissima is the, uh, <clears throat> the scientific name. And I've been looking at how to identify this particular tree and, and try to avoid uh, confusing it with some uh, native lookalikes such as uh, the sumacs and the black walnut that, or maybe hickory that can have similar uh, looking characteristics, especially the leaf, the compound leaves. Then we'll look at some of the insecticides uh, controls that have been proven to be effective. And actually this particular insect uh, is not all that difficult to control when you get proper coverage with uh, insecticides. Of course, uh, I do a lot with integrated pest management, IPM, and we try to not use excessive uh, amounts of insecticides. And there's a number of different um, uh, uh, various uh, types of control methods that we can use and not just simply relying specifically on insecticides, but that certainly will be one we'll talk on, uh, but, uh, but there's other methods as well. And then we're gonna have a look at the tree of heaven and the herbicide treatments that are available. And since this tree is the one that really often is gravitating to this insect as far as uh, it's being attractive to them, We'll look at Tree of Heaven and, and how to maybe control this particular invasive, which is an invasive uh, exotic tree uh, from Asia itself. And then also we'll look at uh, one particular type of uh, 
um, the male tree of heaven and use them as trap trees, which has been done in Pennsylvania. And uh, it has some effectiveness, but it's just another um, um, one of these various methods of controls that we can utilize. So it's an integrated approach uh, and not simply uh, relying on one single tactic. And then we'll look at very briefly some of the spider lanternfly biological controls. We're not there yet with our, our we're not there yet with our biological controls. Uh, maybe within uh, a lot of research is being done and bringing in various uh, parasitoid wasps and so forth. And we have some predators that are present with us now, but we'll look at uh, and we'll get to that if we have time. Okay, so uh, why are some of these, uh, you know, invasive insects such as the spotter and lanternfly becoming a problem? Well, it's just the fact that trade is becoming uh, more and more common, even though even before we had uh, extensive globalism, we still had these invasive uh, insects and diseases and uh, things like weeds and plants that come in uh, that are not native to our North American continent. And uh, this globalism enhances the spread of these exotic organisms uh, around the world. As I said, uh, spotter lanternfly was apparently first arrived in Pennsylvania in Berks County on landscape stone material that was shipped in from uh, Southeast China in, uh, I think, in 2012. Okay, so here we have the uh, two adult stages, the male and female at the top, and then down below we have the fourth instar nymphal stages. And as you can see, uh, this is really quite an attractive insect. Uh, it is a plant hopper. Uh, the hind wings of the adult have that scarlet red coloration, which when they uh, are not at rest, this red color is very prominent and you can uh, observe it and it's really a, a vibrant coloration to it. And then we have the fourth instar. There's actually four nymphal instars and then there's the adult stage. So there's five life cycles if you count the in insect uh, eggs, there's six. And so by the time they get to the fourth instar, they begin to, to have this red coloration. And the, uh, the adults and the fourth instars particularly, they, they like to feed uh, on alkaloids which is a toxin. It's a plant defensive organism that's found in uh, the tree of heaven. It's also found in a lot of our maples and, and many other types of trees. Um, but the, when they begin feeding on these alkaloids, especially when they reach that fourth instar, they're able to manufacture uh, uh, cantharidin toxins within their body, which creates that red coloration. Apparently it does cause a bit of a uh, distasteful uh, you know, when they, it's consumed by potential predators. And so that red coloration alone is often a warning uh, signal in nature to maybe this particular host insect that you're gonna feed on if you're a predator may be toxic. And so a lot of, uh, of our insect predators and birds and so forth have a tendency to leave these guys alone uh, because, and certainly as you have grazing animals, you don't want them to feed extensively on these insects if they're around. Uh, uh, grazing animals. Okay, and it's going through the life cycles, uh, stages one through four, as shown here. You got number one. We have the egg stage, which is about one inch in size. This was a egg mass that was taken. Uh, I believe it was in uh, about mid-April, a few years ago, and so it had been overwintering and weathering for quite a few months, maybe five months or, or, or so, and then they begin to kind of break down and crack up. Uh, Initially, when they're laid, I have pictures when the egg masses are first laid, they look a little bit different, but uh, that's more of a putty or a mud-like appearance that uh, the female covers their egg masses, a string of eggs, and one with the egg mass contains somewhere between 30 and 50 eggs. And each female typically lays maybe two egg ma masses during her lifetime, uh, possibly a little bit more. There's been occasionally where a female may lay three or even occasionally more rare would uh, be four, four egg masses. But uh, so for the most part, uh, a typical female will be laying anywhere from around uh, 60 to 100 eggs during her lifetime. And then uh, after the eggs hatch, uh, and you can see the sizes, I'm not gonna talk about that too much, but they're quite small when they first hatch out is the first instar nymph. And the first three instars have that black, jet black coloration with the, the white spots to them. And uh, then they molt uh, and they go to the, uh, second instar and the third instar, they still contain that same black color with the white spots. They just simply enlarge, them, enlarge themselves by 
uh, maybe 50% or 30 to 50% each time they molt, they get a bit larger and they shed their skins because it gets too small for them as they grow in size. And then they molt from the third instar to the fourth instar, which is the, the bottom left there shown. And that's when you get that striking red coloration. Apparently they have enough of this uh, cantharidin toxin within their system where they begin to produce this red coloration. And you notice it has a red blotching with the white spots and the, the black streaks shown there on the body. And they're getting a little bit bigger now. They can be a half inch, maybe even a little bit larger in size. And then uh, they molt to the final instar, which is the adult stage shown in the bottom right. And uh, there it is at rest. And if you open up the, it has two pair of wings. And if you open up those wings on the hind wing area, you have that bright scarlet red coloration. Uh, they're okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, it's, as I mentioned, it's the species uh, binomial name, uh, scientific name is Lycoma delicatula, and it's in the order Hemiptera. And uh, we have a lot of Hemiptera that we're familiar with uh, that are native here in um, our part of the country. Things like uh, cicadas are Hemiptera, uh, 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 you know, aphids are Hemiptera. You got things like uh, stink bugs or shield bugs or hemiptera in the hemiptera order. And one of our all favorites, of course, are the, the bed bugs. <laughs> and hemiptera means it's half wing is the, the meaning of that, uh, that term. And the first part of the, of the fore wing is a bit hardened and looks a little bit different uh, than the, the back of the hind uh, fore, fore wing, which is more membranous. And the hind wing is also quite uh, papery membranous. And they're in the family uh, of this particular spotted lanternfly is within the family uh, Flugoridae, which uh, is, fortunately, we only have one of these uh, in, in our part of the Northeast of the United States, and it is the spotted lanternfly. And normally the, uh, the Flugoridae uh, family is a more of a subtropical or even a tropical uh, insect uh, plant hopper type, and they are, really strikingly vibrant colorations to them and they have some odd shapes. Uh, and so it's just a, really a, an artistic dream for these insects. It looks like an artist drew them with the vibrant colorations. Uh, and the Florgaridae apparently is, is a term meaning a fluorescence, even though they do not have the ability to fluorescence, okay? All right, uh, so here's the, just to show you how they're very gregarious swarm feeders, the first instars when they first hatch out. Um, ground degree days, I'm not going to talk about this for the sake of time, uh, but uh, it's just the way it's an accumulation of heat units. It's a way we can kind of determine when we can anticipate certain life cycles of our insects to develop. And we, we use growing degree days to, to, to know when we can start looking for them at a certain life stage. And so typically uh, these, these eggs will hatch around 240 growing degree days, which in uh, central New Jersey, typically somewhere between 100 would be May 1st, and then 400 would be uh, June 1st as far as growing degree days. And so for most parts in the in the Northeast, these uh, these eggs are hatching sometime in May, mid-May or so. They have been shown to hatch uh, in late April in some of the more Southern parts of warmer areas, okay. And they're showing another first instar close up uh, of them first hatching out. They're only about an eighth of an inch and they're quite small, easy to overlook. Some people look at them at first and think that may be ticks. Uh, Okay, and so you can see the arrow pointing to a vacated egg mass. When they vacate the eggs, they have a elongated uh, exit hole to them. Okay, all right. And then here's uh, the second instar, again, a little bit bigger. They increase their size by uh, maybe about 50%, a little more elongated in appearance, okay. And then here we have the third and fourth instar as they continue to go through their life cycle. And uh, they don't really molt into the third instar until maybe the second half of June sometime. I indicate here at uh, 1,220 growing degree days, which depending upon where you are in the northeastern part of the United States, that could be uh, anywhere from uh, maybe late June all the way to you know, early to mid-July. So it does depend upon where you are and when these different, different life cycles are going to be developing. And then uh, you can see they keep increasing in size. But then notice that fourth instar, that uh, striking red coloration. I wanted to make a, uh, show you the, the leaves and the shiny coloration, the sheen there. 
And as these are, <clears throat> these are have piercing sucking mouth parts, you know, all plant hoppers have these plant, uh, um, so um, they have that sheen to them. It's a, uh, it's partially digested sap and they apparently exude it and it rains down on the foliage and the, and the grasses and the weeds that are down below wherever they're feeding on. And it gives that shiny appearance to it. Okay. I'll talk about the honeydew and the problems with it a little more later on. Just more of a close up here, the third and fourth instars as they still continue to go into their final instar stages. And when I say instar, it's just a molting stage. Uh, there's technically uh, five instars present, okay? All right, then here we have the adult stage now and that normally occurs uh, by late July indicates they're about 1700 growing degree days. 2000 in central Jersey is around usually August 1st or on that time. And, but they are, they are active and present uh, from late July all the way into December, which you know, sometimes surprises people. And so the adult stages are certainly active now. And we had a cold night last night. I think it got down in the upper 20s in some areas. And so that may have had a negative effect on some of these adults, unless they were in more protected areas. And so um, as the temperatures get colder, we have a first real hard freeze that will kill almost all the adults. But they are continuing to lay eggs. And just to indicate the, the black sooty mold, uh, it's not really the best uh, shown here. But maybe if you look at the bottom right, you'll see the limb. And the top of the limb is, has a very dark coloration. That just indicates where there's a black sooty mold, which is a ubiquitous fungus. It's not necessarily a truly a pathogenic fungi. It doesn't in, uh, infect the plant, but it does block photosyn photosynthesis from being able to, photosynthesis uh, processes from developing, and it can uh, start to kill uh, you know smaller uh, uh, shrubs or grasses and weeds and so forth as it covers them. Okay. And there's more of the same, uh, some adults feeding and the, the honeydew kind of runs down the bark in this situation and this black sooty mold begins to grow on the honeydew, okay. <clears throat> and this again, more of the same, this happens to be on a gray birch. Uh, so actually gray birch often has these dark patches to them. So I'm not sure if that's the black honeydew that's shown there, but uh, if you indicate there, the adults could be feeding all the way from late July all the way into, into December. So they have a, a long uh, adult stage where they're, they're feeding and, and mating and laying eggs if, uh, as females, okay? And just showing you here where you, there's a particular insect I saw, an adult insect where the forewing uh, had been damaged. And uh, I don't know if it probably couldn't fly anymore, and, but it exposed the, the reddish hind wing and so uh, this insect was not moving hardly. It, it wasn't dead yet, but uh, it probably didn't have much longer to live if it couldn't move around too much. Oh, I could have lived, but it couldn't fly anymore. Okay. And a good shot of the underneath of the abdomen where the, uh, the, the stylet or the proboscis is extending from uh, the, uh, the, the end of the head area. And this happens to be a gravid female which means it's fertilized, it's, it's pregnant. And uh, that, that's, that stylet are, is extremely uh, stiff when it gets to that uh, fourth and especially the adult stage. And uh, you know, that insect is about one inch in size. And so that's, that stylet is extending about halfway across the body. So that's about a half inch long spear. <laughs> so fortunately they don't try to stick that into, uh, into animals, including people, which is good because that would hurt if it tried to stick that into us but it's able to penetrate the bark uh, and, and then suck the, the sap from the phloem to get the, uh, the carbohydrates and the proteins. And one of the reasons why uh, the honeydew gets so, uh, and I think I have a picture showing here. Yeah, here we go. The honeydew really gets thick on the leaves and on the bark and so forth, trunks of trees, is because the, these insects have to, and a lot of uh, hemiptera have to do this, uh, you might be noticed this with aphids too. They do release a lot of a lot of honeydew, and it's because they have to get protein carbohydrates when they feed in the phloem. And phloem is not protein important for the growth and development and reproductive uh, uh, processes. They they have to get enough protein to do this, and so they have to suck up a lot of this uh, sap 
to be able to get the protein they require. And it's uh, only oftentimes the honeydew that is exuded from them is only partially digested. And it's, uh, it contains a lot of uh, sugary carbohydrates still within them. And uh, that attracts ants and wasps and bees and so forth, a lot of vespids. And, it, and then this black sooty mold begins to grow on the surface of the honeydew. And it creates this um, really rather uh, dark coloration on the leaves and the bark. And I have another photograph here shown uh, in the same area where I took the other two shots. Well, you notice the grass and the weeds underneath this tree of heaven where um, it's killed it. This turns it black. And, uh, you know, I walked under this tree. Uh, I didn't have a hat on and I can, it was the middle of the day, it was sunny and it was felt like it was raining because the honeydew was dripping down from the insect uh, 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 spotted and lanternfly that were feeding up higher on the canopy. And it was really quite a sight. It, it had a little bit of uh, an odor to it. it. Wasn't all that pleasant. So I my few photographs and I got out of there. I didn't want to get rained on by the honeydew. <laughs> So, and you can see, see here this photograph, they, they are really high populations that can develop on a tree. And they, they like to have certain trees they really prefer, even if they're a certain tree of heaven, which is their choice, especially as adults. Uh, they will go to the trees apparently what have the, they sense to have the highest sap pressure or turgor pressure. And they'll, they'll go to those trees and they'll go to them act for you know, successive years as well. And so you may have a number of different tree of heaven on a property, and maybe they're only feeding exclusively on just uh, maybe just a handful of them, because they like to go to those trees that have the uh, the highest uh, sap pressure or turgor pressure. I guess it's easier for them to say, take up the, the sap as they're they're using their proboscis or stylet to uh, suck up, uh, you know, from the phloem. But, uh, you know, a, a severe sap pressure can result when you have such severe populations as shown here. And it can uh, you know, be, cause quite a depletion and weaken and, and stress the trees. Uh, and even though most of the trees that they're feeding on, I'll talk about a little bit more as we go on, uh, they have been known to kill Tree of Heaven over maybe a two or three year period if they really congregate in large populations. And I've observed this in more natural type areas. Uh, I don't take pictures of them, I don't think. I don't believe I included those, I should have, okay. And here's showing you uh, a severe, uh, this is a tree of heaven, where uh, you start to develop not necessarily the black sooty mold growing, but you have a, more of these uh, complex of uh, fungi. It's called, they're called a white fungal mats that you can see beginning to develop at the base of the trees. And apparently this is, creates an infection and it can penetrate the bark and, and cause a wilting or a plugging up the vascular system. And this is with maybe a heavy feeding after, you know, certainly three years or so, or even after maybe two years of a smaller tree, it can actually kill the tree. And I have observed that to, to take place. I haven't observed it so much on other types of ornamental shade trees, for example, if they're not tree of heaven, but it's certainly possible, okay? And there's more of the same. It is kind of a disgusting smelling mess and the black sooty mold as well as the white fungal mat shown here. And that's really quite a sight. And this, this particular tree of heaven was severely infested, just probably tens of thousands of uh, adult insects were feeding on this. It was a big tree, okay? And this is the close-up of this white fungal mass that's oozing out of the, the uh, you know, the, the tree, okay. And this more of the same. And it does can girdle the trees. If the tree is girdled, it, uh, you know, creates a, a, a inability or wilting of, of the tree to transport uh, photosynthesates and the phloem and the, even the xylem get plugged up and it creates the death of the tree. And then uh, right now you have the adults, they're still active and they're probably getting fewer and fewer as the weeks go by. Uh, they peaked uh, probably in most cases uh, in October and, and in September, they were very prevalent. And uh, if you notice uh, when they're not in large masses as the previous photographs are shown, you'll often see a pair, male and female pair right next to each other. And always the female is the larger one. Oh, and that's the insects, true in the insect world, the, the females are typically gonna be large and the adults is, at least, the adult females are gonna be larger than the, the male adults, okay? 
And I took a, a side view of a female and uh, you notice it has this yellow swollen abdomen. I actually took this photograph uh, a few years ago. And as I remember, it was in the middle of October, but you can have gravid females and they can start laying eggs in September. Usually it's toward the end of September and they peak their egg laying mostly in probably October, early November. And now they're really starting to slow down. And you can maybe see uh, some of them still around into December. But normally in most areas of the Northeast, by the time we reached uh, the middle of December, in the second week of December, uh, there may be very few of them still around as we may get the colder temperatures. Okay. And they're showing you the egg masses of uh, relatively recently laid eggs. And I wanted to show this contrast because when the eggs are first laid, um, they have this string of eggs anywhere from usually 30 to 50 eggs, uh, and seven or so rows lined up like strings of beads. And then the female puts this putty mud-like covering over them for protection. And when it's first done, this, this putty-like mud covering is white in color. It doesn't last long. Uh, maybe just a day or two, and it starts to change into this more gray, this gray color that's just more on the right-hand side. And as I indicate there, that there can be an inch or an inch and a half or so in size, this muddy, mud-like covering, this putty covering. And you can see these usually in September through uh, into December when they're, the adult females are laying their eggs. Okay. And occasionally you'll see, and it's not actually all that out rare, you'll see a, you know, a string of eggs without that uh, mud-like putty over them. And more than likely what happened is maybe the female adult before they had a chance to put the putty down was interrupted somehow and it was forced to leave. I'm not quite sure, uh, but these naked type egg masses uh, are probably gonna be a little bit less um, able to survive the winter. And, and so their viability may be reduced without having that protective covering over them. I, I don't know the percentage of uh, reduction that may occur but occasionally you'll, you'll see these naked egg masses. <clears throat> the eggs are laid on normally fairly uh, flat surfaces, uh, relatively flat and re relatively firm, uh, hard surfaces. So you're not gonna see these eggs on, on leaves or on small, tiny twigs. They're gonna be laid on something a little more substantial than that. They're not gonna be on leaves. I mean, as I said, on weeds or leaves. But uh, the one on the left is a, a relatively, maybe a inch and a half, two inch size twig. That's large enough for them to put the egg mass on as shown there. That's white, and so that's recently laid. I didn't take that particular photograph, but that was a newly laid egg mass. And then on the right, you have them on a patio block. And it can be on all kinds of surfaces, rusty metal on cars. You see them on sides of houses. Uh, certainly they're all different types of trees, uh, you know, patio furniture toys, uh, and so I uh, have to look very vigilant for looking for these egg masses, and they're easily overlooked. You can see, you look at that a cement block, and you wouldn't maybe even look twice at that, but there's probably at least a couple dozen egg masses on that uh, cement block, and it has that more of that grayish coloration, okay. And then if you do see them, uh, you should try to scrape them away, or you can crush them, but maybe oftentimes it's recommended to scrape them. You can use a uh, hard plastic type or a putty knife, uh, a credit card. Uh, uh, I wouldn't use my credit card, but uh, uh, you know, something that's similar to a plastic uh, credit card like uh, device and uh, use it to scrape it into a bag, maybe have some uh, rubbing alcohol or bleach or uh, you know, hand sanitizer. Uh, I wouldn't waste my hand sanitizer at this time of year. I'd use something like uh, you know, bleach or uh, rubbing alcohol. And uh, some say they resemble praying mantids at cases. I don't see that, but maybe a little bit. Uh, but uh, and, and, you know, just scrape them off. Although I tell you, this is just uh, one of the many tactics can be used. It's cultural type practices. Just simply scraping off eggs. You're not gonna reach a lot of them. They're gonna be too tall up in the tree if it's a large tree and you'll miss some of them. So, but this is just uh, one of multiple tactics that can be used as long as many other things that can help reduce uh, you know, this uh, each time you take an egg mass off, you're probably killing and reducing 30 to, to 50 potential insects that would hatch out of them uh, eventually. But you'll see the uh, the egg masses and be able to scrape them off anywhere from September when they're first starting to be laid, all the way through June when they when the very late uh, 
those are kind of late on the late side hatching out. You can see them into June. So you can scrape them off at that time. And here's showing you the life cycle of the spider lantern fly. I'm not going to go through this because I kind of uh, take a little bit too much time and so it's a little tedious, but you can see the, uh, the, the variable, the months as they go through their install molting stages and, uh, and they have the growing degree days. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with growing degree days, I'll just make a really brief mention to it. It's, it's a, a, an accumulation of heat units, and we use it, as I said, to predict uh, when certain um, insects are going to be developing and, to certain, and growing into certain life stages. And how it's calculated is you, you use a, um, a threshold, growing threshold. It, the typical one used is around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. You take the high temperature day of the day and the low temperature and just average, average them. And then you subtract that number from, or rather subtract the threshold from that number. So if your average temperature for the day was 60 and you subtract 50 from it, so that 24 hour period, uh, you would accumulate 10 growing degree days. And you just continue to add it on to the previous accumulations from the previous day and you just add them all up. By the end of the year in most areas of uh, New Jersey you're up over 3000 growing degree days, 3500 growing degrees. Or in urban areas, it might get up close to 4000, but uh, that's about the extent here in the Northeastern part of, our, of the country. To show you the spread of them, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, the map on the, on the left, indicates the southeastern part of Pennsylvania and a handful of counties that are listed there. Burt's County in, in yellow is where it was first found. And it just radiated in, uh, in concentric rings as the years went by and it became a more, more orange color as they spread and then blue. And uh, now they're through all those the counties that are listed in green. And if you look toward the map on the, on the right, expanded view of, of the, five or six states, you can see how they're now present in many, I think six different states that presently have uh, established infestations that are present, Virginia, Ohio, uh, rather uh, Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. They're not yet established as far as I know uh, in New York state or Connecticut. However, they have been observed, but they have not yet been determined to have uh, an established infestation yet. But that's going to change. As uh, and by the way, this is this is a little bit outdated map. Uh, there as far out now is Allegheny County, and uh, and Beaver County, which is in western Pennsylvania. And so they're just right next to the Ohio border. And uh, one of the reasons why these uh, insects spread is because of Tree of Heaven. And are there Tree of Heaven in Ohio? Oh yeah, they're loaded with Tree of Heaven. And so they're going to be spreading into Ohio probably if they haven't already done so uh, by next year or two. Right? And then here's, uh, again, a little bit, uh, it's a year old, but this, these are the uh, counties in New Jersey where we have eight counties that uh, at the end of December of 2019, they were considered to be uh, under quarantine, which means that they had a established infestation. Now, uh, I haven't looked at the uh, uh, New Jersey Department of Agriculture website uh, the last few weeks. I, I don't know if they've increased the number of quarantine counties. I would be surprised if not by the end of this year, 2020, that uh, the number of counties that are now listed in white will not turn to yellow. So we have eight, and I would not be surprised that a good number of new counties by the end of this year will be considered under quarantine. And so quarantine regulations will have to be followed by uh, those counties uh, starting next year, okay. And so we're trying to limit the um, uh, the spread of this uh, spider lantern fly, and it's some might some will say it's kind of a losing battle, but uh, we are at least limiting it to a degree by not purposely, uh, irresponsibly introducing it into areas that do not have yet uh, infestations. And so, especially if you're a commercial operation, uh, nurseries and greenhouses and landscapers, <coughs> if you are uh, listed under a quarantine county, um, you will have to uh, get a permit if you have to be able to successfully start shipping. Uh, let me take a, a glass of water, excuse me. 
Okay. Before you have to start uh, uh, have this permit, and uh, you have to go onto the websites of the. Uh, the New Jersey Department of Agriculture, and you have to take a test, and uh, that actually was initially uh, uh, established in Pennsylvania. So um, we're, New Jersey is using a lot of the regulations that Pennsylvania had established. No sense of inventing the wheel, and so it works to, to a degree in Pennsylvania, and New Jersey is following the similar types of uh, regulations and guidelines that need to be followed when you're put into a quarantine county. Uh, I have slides that talk about this a little more in detail later. Uh, I don't know if I'll get to it, but uh, uh, I can answer questions if there are any about that. So here are the uh, six states at the end of 2019 where the quarantines had been occurring, at least in a few counties. Uh, New Jersey, as I said, has eight counties. Uh, Pennsylvania, 26, that, that may have expanded. And then you have uh, a handful of counties in these other states that are listed below. So let's talk about the plant hosts of this particular invasive insect. Uh, and there's actually been now known, and it keeps increasing, the known hosts that they feed on. 135 to 155 known hosts, that's the latest number I've, I've seen. And a lot of those include uh, more herbaceous plants as well, not just simply woody ornamentals. And so when the young instars, they often feed on uh, in softer tissues. They don't have that uh, stiff stylet that uh, you'll find on the fourth in the adult stages. And so you often need to find uh, plant hosts that have more soft succulent uh, tissue. They'll actually feed on leaves in the first uh, couple instars or so. The, uh, the adult stages do not feed on leaves at all, only on, on branches primarily or, or stems. So, but those are some of the trees that we know as our landscape trees that are prevalent in our New Jersey landscapes, uh, Tree of Heaven, number one, black walnut, and various maples and sycamore, and birch, magnolia, willows, and the list is extensive. And we have some uh, shrubby type material as well, like sumacs and lilacs, styrac, a small tree, and then and roses. They will feed on roses, apparently. Yeah, <coughs> the arrow in red indicates where the economic damage has been most pronounced uh, so far. And the two that are most striking economic losses in agriculture have been with the grapes and the apples, and also hops to a lesser degree, and some of the stone fruits as well. And so this is where uh, real economic uh, downturns have uh, been occurring. Uh, the grapes uh, and the vines, uh, all life stages of the spotter lantern fly, including adults, can feed on grape vines. Okay. Now, um, they don't feed on the actual fruits, uh, such as apples, but they you know, they certainly do release that black, uh, the, rather that uh, honeydew, and then it coats the apples and the fruits with the uh, the black sooty mold, which makes it, uh, you know, uh, non-sellable unless, unless they're cleaned up. I have uh, at the bottom there conifers with a question mark. Uh, it's not been known or shown to have any conifers, you know, pines and spruces and things of that type uh, that they feed on. Uh, so it's kind of unlikely. There were some early reports that maybe they were feeding on uh, Eastern white pine, but that's now apparently been debunked. Uh, the, they have on rare occasions in Christmas tree farms, uh, maybe laid some egg masses on some of the trees, but that's really quite unusual as well. And it's really quite, quite rare. So, uh, you know, so Christmas tree farms fortunately may not have much of an impact or too much of a concern with uh, their uh, with their conifers, you know Douglas firs and Norway spruces and 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 so forth, various types of firs, and so uh, they're probably in in the clear, but it's certainly just keep an eye out to, and look out for. It's it's certainly not impossible for them to lay eggs on them. And so uh, here's this more the same with the uh, the plants that are at risk. The photograph on the on the left shows a tree of heaven. You know, it's a relatively small young tree, but if you notice the flagging and the wilting that has occurred and uh, the curling of the leaves and the discoloration, that's uh, typically what like, happens, especially after a couple of years of a fairly heavy infestation. And then on, a, on and it's not unusual for them with continued extreme infestations for the tree of heaven to be killed. So <laughs> you do have, some of these other uh, industries, uh, ornamentals and lumber industry, 
that can be negatively affected. Christmas trees, egg masses, kind of questionable. Residential shade trees, you know, it's not been shown that, that they're, they're going to be killing the our shade trees here in the, say, for example, in the Northeast, but they can certainly uh, be a tremendous nuisance, okay, as they move around. And maybe the uh, maple industry, especially perhaps, perhaps the sugar maple industry, there may be a bit more of a concern, okay. And then showing you some of the symptoms like the yellowing and the wilting and dieback, especially of the trees with the two or more heavy infestations. They do remove, um, you know, the, the chlorophyll and, and protein content within the trees by 50 to 60, 65%. And so uh, those uh, are certainly important for growth and development of any kind of a tree. And so that creates a tremendous stress to them. And so that may uh, introduce more secondary type uh, or opportunist. And I, I usually, when I think of secondary opportunists in the insect world, I think of wood worms. They can come in and a tree is weakened, they'll be attracted to those trees and they'll be able to successfully, uh, you know, basically feed on it and, and girdle it and, and take it out. Uh, and, but they'll be attracted to those stressed trees, the wood borers. So they do change their diet. I kind of talked about this briefly. Uh, the nymphalin stars with their less developed uh, stylet, they will feed on leaves and first year stems and uh, just different types of weeds. They'll feed, they don't feed on turf apparently, herbaceous plants. And those are the first uh, uh, couple, two or three instar stages. Then you get to that red stage, that fourth instar stage, and they get, begin to move more exclusively onto woody ornamental tissues and older stems because that stylet is more developed. And then when they become adults, they really prefer to kind of go to, uh, not always, but some of the large, larger trees. Um, and they feed on the woody plant tissue and the, and the flowing vascular tissues and so. And then uh, with the adult stage, uh, uh, it's in, um, I think mostly, maybe the very last week of August and the first week or two of September, where the adults go through a, a pronounced migration stage. They start really moving around. If they're not necessarily feeding on a tree of heaven, which there's their choice, they will try to fly around to look for them. And, uh, but uh, I've observed areas uh, where uh, they were feeding in large numbers on, uh, on maple trees and birch trees, and it's all the way through the fall. And they, apparently they've, they've attempted to feed and they'll move around looking for tree of heaven, but then they come back to these trees when they can't find them. You know, it was, <coughs> it was initially thought, and this has now been debunked, that uh, the tree of heaven had to, at least during certain part of the life cycles, to feed on the tree of heaven to be able to complete the life cycle. This now has proven to be untrue. It was only uh, more recently discovered, I think the end of last year, when this was, you know, uh, pretty much announced that they can complete their life cycle without ever having to feed on a tree of heaven. Now, there may be certain types of trees they, they still may need to do and feed on, uh, but that, that, that research information is still being developed, okay? So uh, first in three on stars on the left, you see the roses, the grapes, the weeds, the sumac, <coughs> and the tree of heaven. The, the tree of heaven, uh, all, all the spider lantern fly life stages can feed on tree of heaven through the entire life stages if they want and they can develop quite well. Uh, but then uh, they begin to migrate as they become to the fourth instar in the adult stage. Interesting when they, the first three instars, when they hatch out on a tree, they'll migrate up and down the trees. And they'll often, uh, when they hatch, they may move up to the higher canopy to feed on the leaves of the tree or they may soft more recently uh, young succulent shoots. And they may actually leave the tree and, and climb down and feed on the, you know, the herbaceous plants or the weeds or the grass that's underneath it. And they go back up and forth. Uh, and then as the adult stage and the fourth instar stage, they look for these larger trees, okay. And the tree of heaven is, uh, talk about this one, it's of course the, the key tree we need to be concerned about. And it is an invasive tree from, who would guess it, from China. And it's the Altissima, uh, rather the Atlantis Altissima. And it, uh, it grows, uh, it has a very uh, uh, acceptable in many different uh, habitats it can grow. Uh, disturbed soils uh, and very harsh growing conditions, urban areas and sidewalks, for example. It, it, it's a prolific grower. 
and it often will be found uh, on sunshade border areas. It can't grow in the full, it can grow in the full sun. However, uh, the tree of heaven does not uh, develop well under a dense shade. And so you're not gonna find it in the middle of a, a densely wooded area, but along the edges or even not toward the middle uh, where it's exposed, they can grow quite well. And, and this photograph shows an abandoned railroad track and a right of way where you got some tree of heaven growing uh, along this area. It's usually disturbed type soils they uh, will find be found along fence rows, you know, roadways. It's really very typically found growing. And they can be a big tree, quite large. And here you got a tree that's, uh, you know, I don't know how long this tall this one is, but they've been shown to, to grow up to about 80 or even 100 feet in, in tall. And, and so the reason, I guess, for the tree of heaven is that the tree is growing so fast, it's reaching toward the heavens. And, uh, it, you know, it can have a, a trunk um, diameter of sometimes as much as six feet. You know, you don't see that very often, but uh, they can get to be an extremely large tree, some of the largest trees around. And uh, this tree is kind of reaching toward the heavens as shown here. And the tree of heaven is found throughout uh, apparently 43 states in the country. And, uh, and so, uh, and there, there's certain parts of the country you'll find it less likely. This map's a little bit deceiving. It's like it's, it's uniform throughout, but if it's just present in any, any of the state areas, even though it's maybe relatively rare, uh, it's shown here in blue. Uh, but toward the middle of the country, you'll see less of the tree of heaven. But uh, it was introduced uh, initially uh, in the middle of the uh, 1780s. It was brought into Philadelphia as, a, as an urban shade tree. You know, not a, necessarily a good idea, but it's also been planted uh, you know, throughout the 19th century exclusively in parts of Baltimore and Washington, D.C. And uh, so it's, it's here and it's spread and it's such an invasive plant, it's spread easily. And then <coughs> it was also br brought into the uh, California area in the, uh, in the 19th century as well. So, uh, you know, people thought uh, it was kind of a remarkable tree. It's, have, have, it's probably one of the very fastest growing trees on, on the planet, uh, on the entire planet Earth. So it, it really is prolific in its ability to grow fast. So it has a fairly wide climate zone that it can from range of four through eight. So it's, it's here to stay. It has a, uh, a leaf that makes it uh, relatively easy to identify. Uh, the leaf can be uh, you know, three feet, four feet long, and it has many leaflets that are, it's, a, it's actually, it's a pinnately compound leaf and it has uh, pinnately uh, uh, attached leaflets as shown here, they're opposite or sub-opposite, and they're sh shown here, and they uh, can have anywhere from, uh, if I remember correctly, up to oh, maybe th at least uh, th 31 leaflets, as I remember correctly, and, and uh, so it's, it's quite a long up to four feet long in length, okay. But we can use the, the, the base of the leaf uh, they have these glandular teeth, right? There are usually one or two of them right at the base of each leaflet. And, uh, you know, these are glandular, uh, these glands, uh, teeth areas. And if you don't have a good close-up photograph of it, but uh, this is where when you crush the leaves in that area, you can have that pronounced odor. It's kind of unpleasant. Uh, it's been called uh, maybe like a burnt peanut butter odor. So it's not a, not a pleasant odor. And then on the, on the right, you've got the yardstick three feet and it's showing you uh, all the leaflets attached to this one leaf. So that's one leaf that's attached, okay. You can look at the bark as well. <laughs> one of the trees that, uh, if the trees are large in particular, you might confuse it with, uh, if they're on, you might confuse it with the black walnut, which is on the right. <coughs> but the uh, tree on the left, is the tree of heaven that has a much more smoother appearance to it. A kind of a grayish color. Uh, some have a, compared it to the, uh, the skin of an antelope, uh, rather a cantaloupe, and it does look like that, okay? And then on the right, you can see that the black walnut has uh, much texture as a deep furrowed ridges. So that's very easy to distinguish between the two if they're large trees, okay? 
be a little more of those who are botanically inclined, you can uh, actually remove this, this, the stem, that large compound, innately compound leaf, and it'll leave a leaf scar as shown there on the left, and it has a heart shape to it. Okay, and then if you cut into the, the stem of the Tree of Heaven, it has a pith, a solid pith that has a brown spongy appearance to it. And so it's kind of like a, almost like a chalkiness to it, okay? It's able to, you can dig into it really very easily. It's extremely soft wood, by the way, and very lightweight. Tree of Heaven is not a wood that you want to put in your fireplace. Not a good idea, so don't do that. And then uh, it's important to identify, <clears throat> If you're going to do a trap tree methods to identify which are the female trees. And from about, uh, well, something about the end of July, all the way through the fall, you can even see the seeds sometimes present into the winter months. They have a prolific seed uh, production that they have on their leaves. Literally a large tree can have several hundred thousand leaves, uh, rather seeds, and they are uh, Samara seeds shown on the close up on the right. And there's a single seed. You can see that dark area within each one of the kind of a curled Samara. And they're wind blown and the wind dispersed. And so they're very prolific with the seed uh, as the wind blows them off, off the, uh, the seed clusters, okay. As far as controls, as I said, they're not all that difficult to control. Uh, during uh, probably the month of June through August, you can go with uh, systemics, which uh, there's two of them in particular called neonicotinoids, dinotephron and imidacloprid. Imidacloprid takes a little bit longer for the tree to uptake, but these are systemics, meaning that uh, there's different methods you can apply these insecticides. You can do it as a soil drench, you can do it as a trunk injection, which is done by professional applicators usually. And then also you can, uh, you can do it as a, uh, a bark spray. And then uh, the, the phloem, rather not the phloem, but the xylem will take up the insecticide and through the vascular tissue, they'll move uh, the insecticide up into the upper canopy. Uh, canopy. And then uh, metacloprid, it may, if it's a big tree, it may take a couple months or so. Dinotephron, which is uh, the material that is probably best for homeowners to use, which uh, is called Transtech. It's a bark treatment. Just need a hand can spray or mix it with water and apply it on the circumference of the uh, of the tree about up to maybe about four or five, four and a half foot in height, five foot at most, and then completely around the circumference of the tree down to the base. And uh, just follow the, the label directions. If that's something that a homeowner can buy, you don't need a uh, pesticide license. Probably the easiest thing. I do that uh, myself uh, with the trees I've treated works very well. And that uh, that's a more water soluble material and it can penetrate the bark more readily and move up the uh, into the canopy within just a matter of weeks, even if it's a large tree. So uh, some of the contact insecticides that are a little bit below the neonicotinoids are what can be applied from uh, you know, May through, uh, even if maybe kind of now is getting a little bit late to apply them, I would maybe wait. Uh, but uh, you can still do that. Some of the contacts include things like pyrethroids, um, which are available to home homeowners very readily. One of the more commonly used contact insecticides that at last has a residual of two or three weeks. And then you have the, the ones that have been around for a decade, some like uh, many, many decades, is seven, uh, which is uh, carbamate and malathion. And uh, those are very effective. Um, uh, and then you have the more biorational types that are in arrows, pyrethrums and pyrethrins. They have a, they have a, you know, fair or good control, but they don't have much of a residual, and so you have to treat these numerous times. <coughs> and things like Bovaria bassiana is actually a, a, a botanical type of an, an, an insecticide, and uh, they uh, may have, require multiple applications, and maybe for just small small trees, uh, you know, small shrubs, that might be one if you wanna use more of a organic approach. Neem oil is another one, uh, doesn't have much of a residual to it, but can give you, you know, fair results, but with multiple applications, okay. And there are other techniques I'll talk about briefly, although I see I'm running out of time. 
kind of finishing up here, you got the sticky band trunk banding, which I uh, I think I'll probably skip. I have a, just a slide or two on that. And then we have the systemic herbicides that are important to remove the, the tree of heaven if you're trying to kill them, uh, kill this particular invasive tree, which is probably a good idea. And we'll finish up if I probably don't have time to talk about the beneficial organisms, okay? So this is just showing the sticky banding trap. It's just a, another additional uh, tactic that can be used to, to help reduce uh, the number of, uh, of uh, spotted lanternfly because of this migration habit they have. It really works best with the uh, the earlier instars as they move up and down the tree. You can catch them with these sticky bands that you wrap around the trunk of the tree. <coughs> Some say you need to be concerned about maybe un undesirable, or rather desirable wildlife being caught on them. So you may want to wrap a, a hardware cloth around to prevent that from happening. But uh, and then you may have to change it every uh, couple of weeks or even less, uh, depending on how, how high of an infestation they build up. Okay. So uh, the herbicides used to control the tree of heaven, this is important. Uh, there's a very different death and types of methods you can use. Uh, some are foliar applications uh, using uh, herbicides like triclopyr and glyphosate. You can actually mix those together and spray them. And then you have basal bark treatments, uh, usually Triclopyr is what's considered best, and that's uh, you just simply uh, use it on the the base or the basal type of treatment uh, up to about maybe a 18 inches around down to the base of the of the stem, and this is best for stems that are about one inch to six inches in size. And then you have a what's actually a type of a frill type technique, or sometimes called the hack and squirt technique, where you use uh, either um, you know. Uh, actually, I only have triclopyr, but you can lose glyphosate on this technique as well, and uh, water-based. <laughs> and then when you have stems that are greater than six inches, you may want to try this. Uh, and you use a hatchet, so uh, one, and you know, make a notch in the tree. Don't completely girdle the tree because you still want the photosynthates to be able to travel down to the roots um, and uh, not have the tree shut down. And so uh, you want the uh, herbicide to be able to translocate down to the roots. And the, the roots of Tree of Heaven are extremely extensive. It's been shown to have, well, it's a sizable tree over 50 feet in distance. And, uh, and then they have start having, they're, they're a clonal type grower. Um, they grow in colonies. And uh, when they come from the same basic root system, they're all the same gender. If it's a male, they're all male trees. Or if it's a female, they're all female trees. And um, so if you wanna kill the roots, it's important to um, kind of the larger tree in particular, use this frill technique or hack and squirt technique. I don't have slides to show you how it's done, but uh, you do a, a hatchet cut around the circumference of the tree, but don't leave, leave gaps between each of the, uh, the cuts you're making to uh, maintain the, the transpiration uh, up and down the vascular flow. And, and then wait about 30 days after you apply this. So if it's a, say a seven inch diameter, you make seven cuts, apply the, um, the herbicide, the traclopyr glyphosate uh, uh, amine, uh, if it's a glyphosate, if a traclopyr would be the amine water-based material, and then wait 30 days, at least 30 days before you cut it down. If you, uh, so I'm showing the next slide, if, well, just show you here the. <laughs> I had to put this slide in. This is my niece's place in Berks County, and a lot of these front photographs I've taken are from my relatives that all live in Berks County, Pennsylvania. And I started taking pictures of this uh, in uh, 2016, four years ago, when they all began developing populations on their landscapes. I have four relatives with landscapes, all with the uh, Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly problems. <laughs> And uh, this is my niece, and she had it growing right next to her house, a tree of heaven. And uh, I told her, you know, before you cut it down, it wasn't, uh, it was maybe about a six foot tree at the time. And I said, before you cut it down, you know, make sure you apply a herbicide to it. And then and, and maybe, uh, you know, wait, wait a while, let the, uh, the material flow down to the root system before you cut it down. Well, she didn't do any of that. She just cut it down. And guess what now? She's got you know, probably a dozen of these shoots growing all around. And this is like after about maybe two two years of growth. And it's worse than it was before. And I, I said, yeah, she doesn't believe me, I guess. And uh, I'm going to try to convince her to use uh, an herbicide before she cuts them again. All right. 
So this is the mistake that maybe is being done, especially with larger trees, is that you, you cut the tree first and then you apply the herbicide. Well, you may uh, prevent sprouts from coming from the trunk, but you're not gonna be able to prevent the, the shoots coming from the roots that are maybe extensively growing and, and uh, quite a distance from the tree. So uh, don't make the mistake of cutting first and then applying the herbicide to the trunk because you're not gonna more than likely kill the more, successfully kill the more distant roots. So wait at least 30 days. And so <laughs> maybe it's about time I had to finish up here. So this is the uh, technique that was first developed out of, out of uh, Pennsylvania, Penn State. And it's uh, using nail trap trees where you identify what, what trees in an area, if there's many of them in a large area, cut the females down, you know, apply the herbicide first, wait the 30 days, cut the trees, and then maybe leave 10%, 15% of a of, of few, few of the male trees. And what this is designed to do is use these male trees that are remaining as uh, basically trap, <coughs> trap trees, but before you have to apply a systemic insecticide, I think the product of choice, which is often the um, dinotefron, is giving you maybe the most consistently best efficacy, is this dinotefron or safari or transtech is the, the some of the brand names for it. And then as the material moves up into the canopy and the uh, and the the insects begin to feed on the tree, uh, they they take up the uh, insecticide and it kills them. So this is shown to kill uh, maybe maybe thousands and thousands of uh, insects. And uh, they keep going to the same tree, especially if it's a tree that uh, they've been attracted to because of the high turgor pressure. Maybe select those trees as the ones you apply the insecticides to. And you, you usually have a pretty effective uh, you know, suppression. And it doesn't necessarily control them but uh, completely, but it does suppress them. Okay, well, I see my, my hour is up. And so I didn't have time to talk about the, paras the various parasitoid wasps that are being introduced. And this is uh, being done by a lot of beneficial insectary labs, often uh, run by some of the state universities uh, or Department of Agriculture uh, within the various states where this pest is becoming a problem. And this is gonna continue to be developed with more and more research. With, so it's not gonna be something that's gonna be used, you know, valuable right now, but it's certainly, as the years go by and maybe within a decade or two, this is something that uh, we'll be able to have even better uh, ability to keep this insect uh, a bit more satisfactory under control. And uh, there's also other things like the entomal pathogenic fungi, which I won't talk about, my time is up. And we do have a few predators around that feed on them, but there's just not enough of them. These are mostly uh, solitary type predators, things like the uh, praying mantids and the barn spiders and the assassin bugs and green lace wings and predaceous stink bugs. But there's just not enough of them uh, to feed in large masses, but they maybe make at least some contribution, but there can't be relied upon to really create the type of uh, uh, suppression and control that we're going to be looking for, hopefully, in some of the years ahead. Okay, this is a little bit uh, disappointing to hear. Kind of last, my, maybe on my last slide, showing you that uh, to successfully control a generation of spotted lanternfly in high density populations, you need to achieve 93 to 97 percent mortality. That's kind of depressing. <laughs> uh, so that kind of indicates that you know using Biologic controls may only achieve suppression and not eradication. So unfortunately, I think this insect is here to stay. It's just a matter, can we suppress them and reduce them to more satisfactory levels? And as the and many, many years go by, uh, maybe we'll get to that point, but uh, more research uh, needs to be done as we go forward, okay? Uh, I don't have time to talk about the quarantine and information, <laughs> but uh, I just want to make a quick express thanks to the Penn State Cooperative Extension, who I've attended so many courses that I've attended uh, from the Penn State Extension over the last uh, four or five years, probably uh, more than, well more than a dozen of them. And so I want to express thanks to them. They've done a great job. Penn State Extension is, of course, first to deal with this. And they've done a wonderful job of educating the commercial and the, and the general population on this pest. So I'll let Joel take over from here. And if you have some questions, uh, we can proceed. All right. Uh, great job, Steve. Man, that was very detailed. It was really neat to see the, uh, 
different stages of the fly and uh, yeah. also all the information yeah. about the tree of heaven too. Very, very helpful. Oh, great. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, it is discerning that you got to kill so many of them to probably yeah. have a positive impact because that's a high number. Well, it's, uh, it's not a matter of eradicating them right now. It's just a matter of what can we do to keep, uh, suppress them to a degree that's more reasonable or more satisfactory. Yep. So that's, at least now, that's the goal. So. Right. All right. Well, if anyone's out there, we're uh, here waiting for your questions. We'll hold for a little while to make uh, give you an opportunity. Uh, the number's there on the screen. And uh, you'll dial the number. You'll put in the meeting ID and then hit the pound sign. Um, but uh, once you call in, I'll uh, put you through and uh, we can answer your questions. Yeah, I've been fortunate to have relatives in Berks County in the right in the the ground zero where this whole thing started in Berks County. And uh, <laughs> it was ideal for me to get all these photographs. Uh, I took most of those photographs through the years at their locations. Do, do we have an idea why, uh, what brought them in the country in the first place or how they actually got there? Yeah, I did. I think I showed one slide, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, they were introduced from uh, from southeast uh, China. Yep. They were brought in on, uh, apparently they were decorative, decorative stones. Hmm. They were brought in for landscapes, you know, design purposes. They were brought in and uh, that's where apparently some egg masses were on these decorative stones. And so that was where they were introduced. Uh, they think that happily occurred in 2012. But they built up and it was an unknown insect to just about everybody. And so they didn't know what it was. And then finally there was a, uh, I think it was a forester, extension forester in, in Pennsylvania in Berks County that uh, notified uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, we need to look at this insect. This is very unusual. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was identified as the spotted lanternfly. Okay, uh, we have a caller. Uh, you're live with your question, hello. Hello. Um, I was wondering, does the it, the honeydew when it like like if there's a lot of it, does it kind of look like 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 an animal urine? Well, uh, it has a very dark black appearance to it. Uh, the fung the fungal the fungal loss growth, and uh, I've not heard that expression before. But uh, it uh, is a, you know, it's obviously a mold. It's a fungal mold that's really dark black in appearance. And it can be relatively thick and it covers the plant tissue and it blocks uh, you know, photosynthesis from occurring and it, it kills plant tissue, you know, leaves and, and smaller, smaller shrubs and weeds and, and grasses and so forth. So yeah, it builds up into copious, uh, copious amounts as it grows on the surfaces of the, the honeydew. Okay, thank you. Yeah, when I when I walk, Joel, when I walk sometimes underneath the uh, these trees of my relatives, I would walk underneath of them and the grass was had a crunchy feel to it. It was like a crust. Uh, and and uh, I didn't really like walking in that area is where it was such severe infestations. And so. Right, and you said uh, you may note a couple times of there an odor associated with it as well. Yeah, so could... yeah it is. Uh, there's a kind of an unpleasant odor to it, yeah. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't it be good to have that in your front yard at all? Oh, no, no. Well, the, the trees that are in my relatives' landscapes, they're all kind of like in the back uh, the back corner locations. So they're not all that concerned about it, but it just creates a, creates a nuisance because you have the adults during that migration period that begin to fly around. And one of my, one of my, my sister actually has a, a, a built-in swimming pool. And uh, during the months of uh, late August, the weeks of late August and, and early September, it's a constant battle of taking all the spotted lanternfly adults that fly into the swimming pool. Mm. They, they, they remove hundreds and hundreds of them during the, there's those weeks that, uh, where this migration is occurring. Yep. So it's a, it's a major nuisance for them, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've I've seen pictures of like the Pennsylvania Turnpike where they just covered the whole entire shoulder of the road. I mean, just you would not think there'd be that many flies, but it's amazing. And they're so big too. They really do take up a lot of space. Yeah. <clears throat> just just to comment, I uh, know they even though the common name was lantern fly. They're they're not a fly. <laughs> right. Exactly. They're not a they're not a diptera. They're a they're a plant hopper. Okay. Okay. And so uh, uh, so call them uh, call them plant hoppers. Don't call them flies. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll note that. Yep. Yeah. I do a lot of fly fishing, so I try to pay close attention to flies in particular. Uh, but I'll have to look out for those plant hoppers. All right, Steve. Well, I want to thank you for the uh, program. It was some very useful information. You gave us all some, uh, you know, tips and things we could do to tackle the problem if we have them in our yard. So I greatly appreciate that. And uh, on that note, I think I'll uh, shut oh, down. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you okay, have well, great. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening. All right. Uh, I'll see you nope, on I think the I other covered side. More than I needed to. All right. Sure enough. Thanks.